Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to everyone for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. Greenlight storefronts are currently closed and locked, but our community is still here. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, you can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you. They can see your name over in um, our attendee list and they'll see your name pop up when you message in chat or raise your hand. Um, we have a few different Zoom features we'll be using tonight that you can see if you scroll down to the bottom of your window. Uh, one is labeled chat. You can use that to post comments throughout the event, say hello to the authors, provide some applause um, and talk with each other. You'll also see down at the bottom of your Zoom window an icon labeled raise hand. We'll be using this um, at the end of the event during our Q&A portion. If you have a question for um, Kwe Mai, you can hit that icon and it'll show us that your hand is raised and we'll, we'll be able to unmute you so that you can ask your question out loud to the author. We are recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our website and social media channels later on. Tonight's featured book, The Mountain Sing, is available for sale from greenlightbookstore.com. Though our stores are closed, we're working with our supplier warehouse for fast direct-to-home shipping. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. And we're offering a special discount for event attendees. Use coupon code MOUNTAIN at checkout to get $5 off the Mountain Sings before May 8th. Good Our interviewer for this evening is Wayne Carlin. He's a Vietnam veteran, award-winning author, and editor of Curbstone's Voices from Vietnam series. His books include three works of nonfiction and eight novels, the most recent of which is Juniper Prize for Fiction winner, A Wolf by the Ears. He's the recipient of two fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, Patterson Prize for Fiction, and the Vietnam Veterans of America Excellence in the Arts Award. He'll be speaking with our featured author, Quê Mai. Born into the Vietnam War in 1973, she grew up witnessing the war's devastation and its aftermath. She worked as a street seller and rice farmer before winning a scholarship to attend university in Australia. She's the author of eight books of poetry, fiction, and nonfiction published in Vietnamese, and her writing has been translated and published in more than 10 countries, most recently in Norton's Inheriting the War Anthology. She's been honored with many awards, including the Poetry of the Year 2010 Award from the Hanoi Writers Association, as well as many grants and fellowships. Her new book, The Mountain Sing, tells an um, enveloping multi-generation tale from the Tron family, set against the backdrop of the Vietnam War. Quay Mai is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then she'll be talking with Wayne and with all of you. Quay Mai, please take it away. Thank you so much, Chelsea, for an excellent, amazing introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm here in Munich. Germany, so it's 1.30 in the morning, so if my mind is not sharp today, please forgive me, and I hope when he's not going to ask me very difficult questions, <laughs> but just kidding, he, he and you can ask anything. Uh, so my book um, is uh, told in the voices of two women, Grandma Ziu Lan and her granddaughter, Hương. And so I'm going to read a passage from uh, chapter one that will let you um, meet the, these two characters. And this scene uh, takes place after some bombing scenes of Hanoi in 1972. And um, Hương's parents had gone to war as well, as well as her uncles. So she's waiting for news from them. And this is in 1972 at the height of the Vietnam War. I was rereading Bạch Tuyết và Bảy Chú Lồn immersed in the magical world of Snow White and her friends, the Seven Drafts. When grandma came home, my school bag hanging off her arm. 
Her hands were bleeding, injured from trying to rescue people trapped under rubble. She pulled me into her possum and held me tight. That night, I crawled under our blanket, listening to grandma's prayers and her wooden bells chant. She prayed for Buddha and heaven to help end the war. She prayed for the safe return of my parents and uncle. I closed my eyes, joining grandma in her prayer. Were my parents alive? Did they miss me as much as I missed them? We wanted to stay home, but urgent announcements from public broadcasts ordered all citizens to evacuate Hanoi. Grandma was to lead her students and their families to a remote place in the mountains where she would continue her classes. Grandma, where are we going? I asked. To Habing village. The bombs won't be able to find us there, Guava. I wonder who had chosen such a lovely name for a village. Habing were the words carried on the wings of doves painted on the classroom walls of my school. Huabing bore the blue color of my dreams, the color of my parents returning home. Huabing meant something simple, intangible, yet most valuable to us, peace. Is the village far, Grandma? How will we get there? On foot, it's only 41 kilometers. Together we can manage, don't you think, Guava? How about food? What will we eat? Oh, don't you worry. Farmers there will feed us what they have. In times of crisis, people are kind. Grandma smiled. How about helping me pack? As we prepared for our trip, Grandma's voice rose up beside me in song. She had a splendid voice as did my mother. They used to make up silly songs, singing and laughing. Oh, how I miss those happy moments. Now, as grandma sang, vast rice fields opened their green arms to receive me. Stocks lifted me up on their wings. Rivers rolled me away on their currents. Grandma spread out her traveling cloth. She piled our clothes in the middle, adding my notebook, pen, ink bottle, and her teaching materials. She placed her prayer bell on top, then tied the opposite corners of the cloth together, turning it into a carrying bag to be wrapped around her shoulder. On her other shoulder hung a long bamboo pipe filled with uncooked rice. She had already packed my school bag with water and food for the road. How long will we be away, Grandma? I'm not sure, perhaps a couple of weeks. I stood next to the bookshelf, my hands running over the book's spines, Vietnamese fairy tales, Russian fairy tales, Nguyen Kien's daughter of the book seller, Treasure Island from a foreign author whose name I can't pronounce. Grandma laughed, looking at the pile of books in my hands. We can't bring so many guava. Pick one. We borrow some more from when we get there. But do farmers read books, Grandma? My parents were farmers, remember? They had all the books you could imagine. I went through the bookshelf again and decided on Duan Zoy's novel, The Southern Land and Forest. Perhaps my mother had arrived in Myanmar, that southern land, where she met my father. I had to know more about their destination, cut away from us by the French and now occupied by the Americans. Grandma glued a note onto the front door, which told my parents and uncles that in case they returned, they could find us in Hua Bing. I touched the front door before our departure. Through my fingertips, I felt my parents' and uncles' laughter. Now, looking back over the years, I still wonder what I would have brought along if I had known what would happen to us. Perhaps the black and white picture of my parents on their wedding day. But I also know that on the verge of death, there is no time for nostalgia. 
At grammar school, we join the throng of teachers, students, and their families, several with bicycles piled high with luggage, and walked, merging into the mass of people moving away from Hanoi. Everyone wore dark clothes, and metal parts of vehicles were covered up to avoid reflection from the sun. For fear of attracting bombers, nobody talked. I could only hear footsteps and the occasion, occasional cries of babies, terrors, and worry carved lines on two people's faces. I was 12 years old when we started that 41-kilometer walk. The journey was difficult, but grandma, Grandma's hand warmed mine when the wind whipped its bitter cold against us. So that I wouldn't be hungry, Grandma handed me her food, pretending she was already full. She sang, she sang countless songs to calm my fears. When I was tired, Grandma carried me on her back, her long hair cupping my face. She had bundled me into her jacket when it started to rain. Blood and blisters covered her feet as we finally got to Hua Bing village, nestled in a valley and surrounded by mountains. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. That um, image of the mountains in the title of your book, you know, The Mountains Sing, um, your family, like like most families in Vietnam, have gone through all of that, um, through occupation, through starvation, through land reform, through the war. You know all of that. Um, uh, it made me it made me wonder why do this as fiction. What what was it that you felt you gained by writing this as a novel rather than a, as a, a memoir of your family? Yeah, as you know, you know, Vietnam has such a long and um, turbulent history. You know, we experienced the Mongolian um, occupations and colonization from Mongolians, Chinese, French, Japanese, Americans. So if you talk to any Vietnamese history, uh, family, their family history can be written into a, an epic yeah of the history, right? Either nonfiction or fiction. In my case, I started this novel with a, with a very crazy idea. It's absolutely crazy um, because I was born without um, a grandma, you know, both of my grandmothers had died before I was born. So I wanted to find my grandma by writing this book. So I, when I was a child, I told myself, you know, you know, my friends had grandmothers. How about me? You know, one day I want to have a grandma too. So I wanted to write this book. So in writing this, this book, I wanted to search for the faces of my grandmother. I wanted to see them and, and, and hear them and get to know their dreams and hopes. And of course, I did a lot of research. I interviewed a lot of people, people in my family, people in my village and my parents' villages and those I know. And I, the, the joy of working on fiction is that you, you experience the magic of imagination. Mm -hmm. There were so many nights that I suddenly woke up because my characters told me, said, get up, get up. We need to tell our stories. And every day as I worked on the book, I heard them urging me on. And actually I started this novel not knowing where it would take me. And my, and my um, mentor, my mentor at that time, Sarah Mylan, I was doing a master in creative writing. And she said, trust the creative power of your inner mind, you know, trust your characters where they want to lead you. So I, I learned to trust my imagination and it led me where, I, where, where the story needed to go. Uh, so in writing this book, I, I found my grandma, I found my family story, but also stories of so many Vietnamese. And I found my, um, my own emotions when it comes to different historical events of Vietnam as well. And, and, and I remember that uh, Tim O'Brien um, wrote in The Things They Carried. Yeah. You know, writers or, or, or novelists uh, make up um, events that didn't actually occur, but these, if, by making them up, we, act, if we clarified what actually happened. So I did not know a 
you know, a lot about the circumstances or the events of the, the great hunger or the land reform. But when writing about it, in fictionalizing, um, I base my imagination on research and on my research and actually um, it became clear to me what happened. And because my grandma, one of my grandmothers was um, killed in the um, great hunger of 1945, mm. it was actually tied to corn plants um, because, you know, um, there was no more, more f food to eat. So her children were dying. So she had no choice. Um, she had to venture into a corn plant. Um, a corn, you know, corn field, and, and she um, decided to steal some corn. And my father told me that the guard of that um, field caught her and he tied her onto the corn plants. Mm -hmm. And he was too weak to break away. And um, so in writing about her death, um, I discovered my emotion, my anger, but also my resolution. And I found forgiveness in the end because the, the man who killed her had moved away from our village and I had wished so many bad things on him and his family. But actually, mm. I, in writing, I found the need to forgive because like Grandma Ziolan said, if we bear crutches, we are the ones who have to bear the burden of sorrow. Yeah. I think forgiveness is, is the greatest gift we can give for, give our, ourselves, you know, because as humans, we always make mistakes and we first have to forgive ourselves and we have to forgive others around us. Well, there's so, so much in that answer. Um, I, I, I really love the idea and I think it's, it's common to any you know, novelists and fiction writers of, of your characters coming to life and you, you being able to live through them. I, and I love the idea of you creating your grandmother and then, you know, make, making her real. Um, the last thing you said, you know, and, and I've, I've heard that from Vietnamese also that, you know, if you, if you keep, keep hating someone, it's like um, trying to harm them by drinking poison yourself. Exactly. That, that, that need for, for forgiveness. Um, and, and that, I mean, that's a theme that, that seems to run through the whole novel, you know, that idea of, mm -hmm. of forgiveness. And um, like, like a lot of American veterans who have gone back to Vietnam, I found that people were, in spite of all the damage we did to that country, I was welcomed warmly, um, particularly by veterans, by people who had, who had fought against us. And I know there's a, there's a scene in a novel with uh, Uncle Dot, who was a veteran, he lost his legs in the war, and he remembers painfully um, ambushing a group of American soldiers who were bathing in the river. And he, start, he, he starts thinking about their parents, about it, how they're going to feel. They, they're, they're killed. And he, and he says, finally, uh, I couldn't hate them anymore. What I, what I came to hate was war, you know, was war itself. Um, so there's always that um, lot of healing between Vietnamese and Americans, but there seems less so between uh, Vietnamese and Vietnamese. Uh, mm. uh, there's... Um, most of the damage that you see in the novel is inflicted, you know, like you're just describing with, with land reform and, and what happened to your own grandmother. It's that, that's the type of damage you see in the novel. Uh, the Tran family itself has people on both sides as, of the war, as happened. And there's, you know, a lot of tension in the family because of that. So I'm, I'm wondering two things. Um, you almost answered the first one is how Vietnamese are able to forgive Americans, you know, to, to come there and, and have the marvelous welcomes I've had, and I know many other veterans have, um, but also why it's so difficult, why, why it's easier to forgive us than it is to forgive each, give, give yourselves, forgive each other. So with your first question, um, I'm not sure whether there's total forgiveness for Americans. Yeah. Americans did in Vietnam was, I think, unforgivable. More than 3 million Vietnamese died. And nowadays, I mean, I volunteered in, um, in places with um, kids disabled from Agent Orange. And yeah. it's painful. And I think America has to do more for Vietnamese people. 
um, you know, like there are so many victims of all Agent Orange out there who need help. If you go to the Agent um, um, Orange uh, orphanages, you know, orphanages that care for Agent Orange victims in Vietnam, the situations are terrible. The, 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 the children there, they need help. There's, uh, there's still um, a strong need to clean up, um, you know, because a lot of the areas are still, um, you know, um, poisoned by Agent Orange. And I think, um, I think for us to forgive the American army, I think the army should be less aggressive in waging war. I, I must express my unhappiness seeing the violence that is taking place in the world. And um, as a child growing up, I was thinking to myself, you know, human, the human race could not be so stupid as to wage war on each other again, you know, seeing the devastation again around me. But coming back to your, uh, to your um, question, I do agree that a lot of, uh, of Vietnam veterans have come back to Vietnam and have done great things, have helped to build school, have, um, you know, helped with medical care. And the best thing is that a lot of veterans like you have written about the war to bring out the horror of it, to prevent it, to call for peace. And that kind of reconciliation really bridge, you know, bring us together. I was thrilled, you know, to be able to facilitate uh, poetry readings among you know, American and Vietnamese veterans. And I think that those, those literature um, conferences really open the way for understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Vietnamese writers have come to the U.S. and you have met many of them. And American writers have come to Vietnam and, and, and it opened the ways, you know, for, for, for dialogues and understanding reconciliation. And as you said, forgiveness, right? But um, for Vietnamese... Uh, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just glad... It's kind of glad to hear you say that there's not a complete forgiveness. I, I think that that can be a, a, a cliche sometimes. And I'm glad to hear that what you tie it to are acts of, acts of redemption. Yes. That it's, it's, it's not just given, it's something, that's, it's something that, that comes about in, in, that kind of, uh, in that kind of active healing. Yes, yes. I, I think because Vietnamese nowadays, we want to move on. We want to forget about the war. Yeah. We want to have peace, we, we appreciate peace, right? But I think when it comes to Vietnamese, it's more difficult because um, imagine if you had a, a fight with an, a stranger compared to a fight against your brother or sister. Uh, you know, the, the pain you feel um, when, when there's a fight with your family is, is yeah. much deeper and much more difficult to heal. And I'm just um, disappointed that there has been um, less um, literary exchanges, you know, among Vietnamese writers and dias diasporic Vietnamese writers. You know, we haven't been able to come together. And I really wish that there would be more pathways opening through literature, because I, like what Hương said in, in the novel, when, when you read other people's, uh, you know, literature, you, you see into their cultures or their, their point of view, mm -hmm. and, and, and you can understand them much more. And I think, you know, for example, I, you know, Vietnam should translate or publish more writings from, from Vietnamese writers who are, you know, who used to fight against the Northern Vietnamese army, for example, or, or more Vietnamese writers inside Vietnam should be read, you know, by, by Vietnamese who live outside Vietnam. So there's still two sides, you know, we still have to work with each other much more. And I, that's why I place the, the mountain sing, the center of the mountain sing is the conflict among Vietnamese people because so much has been written about the war, the relationship between the US and Vietnam, but not much is, 
it's written and highlighted the root causes of our fight and of our trauma because we came from the same family. We come from the same family, you know. The legend said all Vietnamese are born of the same father, of the same mother, um, father Lạc Long Quân, mother Oka, you know. Um, so there's a Vietnamese proverb that say uh, khôn ngoan đối đáp người ngoài gà cùng một mẹ chớ hoài đá nhau. Um, when when um, when we are wise we we can argue with outsiders mm -hmm. being chickens born by the same mother stop fighting so i can roughly translate it like that so we we still talk uh, i mean there's a vietnamese proverb but it's, it's it's still very difficult to come together as i highlighted you know um in in the novel the deep the root causes of our conflict are very deep generations for so many years and um yeah and uh, there's still so much to be done and the, the sad thing is that you know the trauma that we inherit by by the vietnamese are passed on to our our children and grandchildren mm -hmm. yeah. so so if we don't resolve our feelings um the it, it, it will be carried forward so so that's the sad thing but I often think in many ways, um, the American Civil War has never been over here also. And, and you know, you're quite right that the, the fights between families are the most, are the most bitter and the most tragic. You, you also bring up um, the word trauma in that. Um, I, I noticed this when um, there's a point in the novel where Yulan, the grandmother, speaking to her granddaughter, to Hong, says, uh, she excuses herself about being so graphic in describing killing. Uh, she says, there's only one way we can talk about wars honestly, only through honesty can we learn about, can we learn about the truth. So one, one of the things I noticed when I interviewed um, veterans in Vietnam and, and young people also was that uh, when, I, when I brought up the idea of PTSD, it was kind of blanket denial. Um, and in doing that, they were kind of reflecting also an official attitude mm. that there was no real, you know, war trauma um, in Vietnam. Mm. Uh, yet, in, you know, in your book, in, in a lot of contemporary Vietnamese fiction and literature, a lot of the characters uh, clearly show the symptoms of trauma. They're, cl they're clearly traumatized. Mm. All of your characters, in one way or another, by the war and so on, are, are traumatized. So... Two parts to this question too. Um, why do you think that is? First of all, that there's there's th that denial of of trauma, particularly from war, and um, why was it important to you to do what grandmother Zhu Lan said and talk right honestly about war in the way that you do in this novel? So. Trauma is, as you know, you know the the injury inflicted on the mind and. And it's it's um it's the tendency of people of of people to when when they have trauma to deny it you know to avoid being stigmatized. Um, in Vietnam, it's uh, the the situation is um, even worse than normal because in the in Vietnamese culture because there's no no research yet done on trauma and PTSD. So if people display the symptoms of of PTSD, you know they are. Uh, they are seen as being possessed by ghosts. Yeah. So, um, so you know, people totally avoid, you know, being seen as being possessed by ghosts. So, so, um, so then also the the official point of view is that we won the war, you know. So there's no trauma. Mm -hmm. And I heard it from a veteran because in a conference um, I translated for for a dialogue uh, among you know Vietnam. Uh, Americans veterans and Vietnamese veterans and one American asked the Vietnamese uh, do you have nightmare or yeah. do you you know do you still um, have shock during the day when when you recall about some some event the flashbacks so, yeah. flashbacks and he said no we won the war our our fight was um, was uh, for justice you know yeah, yeah. There's no trauma, but actually that's not true. I have a friend who fought in the war, and he said he cannot sleep with a ceiling, um, with with a ceiling fan, 
because um, yeah. when he was a he would think about American helicopters chasing him and shooting him down. And I have another friend um, who was um, who experienced the bombing of Hanoi in 1972, and he told me, you know, um, more than 20 years later, when he boarded an airplane, he heard the engine and he relieved the bombing scene. Um, and then he he was uh, so distraught that he had to uh, be brought out of the airplane. So there's a, a lot of trauma and, yeah. and PTSD in Vietnam. And actually, uh, veterans have told me, Vietnamese veterans have told me that there were a lot of suicides, but it's never written about. You know, I mean, in I read that in, in the United States, more Vietnam veterans killed themselves after returning home the, the number is higher than those who, who died in Vietnam. So in Vietnam, you know, many veterans also committed suicide, but there's no report, no statistic about that. People don't talk about it. And I think because the purpose of my novel is to talk about peace, and you cannot talk about peace unless you, you, you highlight the horror of war. And I think I can write my whole life and still cannot write enough about that horror. You know, the horror is so, when, when a war takes place, um, it's not just the people who die, culture is destroyed, um, societies are destroyed, so many things are destroyed for generations to come. Nature, I mean, the nature of Vietnam was devastated. And nowadays we still, you know, when I was growing up, um, I would catch uh, fish uh, from, uh, from um, ponds and they would be disfigured. Mm. They would be disfigured because our area, you know, like they, they were also um, Agent Orange. And Agent Orange. Yeah, and I actually, I wrote about it because we were so poor. We had to eat the fish. So I wrote a poem. I was thinking that, I mean, I had Agent Orange in me and what would happen? You know, I, I ate the war, the war invaded me, right. but we had no choice at that time. We had to drink the water from the soil. We had to eat the food contaminated. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I mean, the, the amount of Agent, or, uh, Agent Orange spread onto Vietnam is incredible. I used to volunteer in a hospital to help kids with, uh, with cancer, and Vietnam has one of the highest rate in childhood cancer. And the doctors told me, um, I mean, you know, like, like these kids, their, their, their grandparents fought in the war, you know. And I saw kids with a few months old already, you know, had... Um, a lot of problems. Kids six months old have cancer. Can you believe it? And uh, it, it's 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 really um, yeah. We should do all we can to stop wars and the use of of weapons, chemical weapon. I don't know. Humans are just so evil towards each other. We should love each other more and stop fighting. <laughs> you know, such a powerful image. You just said that you you ate the war. And I mean, it explains so much about why you feel like you you need you need to tell us like the grandmother Zulan that that this has to be told. It has to be told. And if you have the skill to tell it, you have to do it. And, and um, you, know, you 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 do something. You you describe something that's very horrible mm. in in a way that I think does change people when they read it. Thank you. Um, there's a line in a, uh, I want to bring up something else also. There, there's a line in a uh, poem by Lethe Ziem Thuy that goes, uh, Vietnam is, is not a war. Mm -hmm. And what, what she means by that is, you know, it's a, it's a line that's given to, to Americans who are not Vietnamese American. Because what it's saying to, to us is that you reduce Vietnam to the war. Then when we, when we, we don't even use the word war. We say Vietnam and that's all it means to us, right? It's... Vietnam the war, not Vietnam the country. Um, in the same way, most of the American fiction about the war mm -hmm. is, you know, concerned with the American experience, which is, is something kind of understandable, but the Vietnamese and Vietnam become a backdrop mm. for, the, for the experience of Americans being there. And, you know, in, in a way, I mean, 
tragically, that was the reality, not only for the soldiers on the ground, but for our leaders also. I mean, Vietnam, the reality of it did not exist for them. Um, and when Vietnamese women are described in such fiction, often they are stereotyped, they're bar girls, they're prostitutes, um, they are exoticized, some, sometimes, you know, just crude and convenient ways of symbolizing Vietnam, like, um, you know, uh, Madame Butterfly as Miss Saigon, or, or to use another country, uh, Graham Greene's Fong in, in Quiet American. So I, I was wondering if you could speak to, it's one of the things that, that really are, are striking about the novel, speak to the way that Mountain Sing um, breaks those Western stereotypes about Vietnamese women and gives them a voice and agency. So I, you, you quoted um, a verse from Lê Thị Diễm Thuy's poem. I think if I'm not wrong, that poem is called Tap No Shots on Blue Water. Right, right? yeah. Um, and it said, let people know Vietnam is not a war. Let people know Vietnam is not a war. Let people know Vietnam is not a war, but a piece of us, sister, and we are so much more. Yeah. Vietnam is so much more. Um, in the mountain scene, you experience the Vietnamese culture, even though the novel is set during the war, but you see so much history, so much culture, so a lot of proverbs, poetry, language, yeah. the beauty of traditions, family bonds, so much more. So Vietnam is like the U.S. or any nation in the world. And I think, you know, um, the, the horror war is that we, we de de dehumanize the other, the other side, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, so um, you, you mentioned about um, Miss Saigon, you know. I have a problem with that play, <laughs> huge yeah. problem. <laughs> Kim is just so you know dependent on the American man to rescue her mm -hmm. and, um, and you know a lot of, of Vietnamese women in, in Viet Vietnam war literature in English are represented as um, background you know to the American story or when they they, they, they are not given a voice and when when they can speak, they sounded really naive, opportunistic. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I wanted to write against that. I wanted to write beyond that, you know, because the, the women I knew, I grew up with strong women, independent women, people, women who don't need men, uh, you know, women who, who, who had no chance to depend on their men because the men had gone to war and never come back. So they had to raise the family and carry the, the, the family forward and, and, and build a future for their, their children. And, um, and you know, um, in, in the novel, um, the Grandma Ziolan, you know, represents the women whom I know, you know, like my, my mother. She, um, both of her, her parents had died really young, but she studied really hard and become, she had to work as a farmer, but she became a teacher. And, and then she, she kept reminding me, you know, you need to study, you know, you need, you know, as, as a girl, you have to be independent, you know. Um, um, so, so, you know, the women in, in, in the novel um, represent the women that I know, I grew up with. Um, yeah, so, um, so, so, you know, it's, it's not just, um, just women, but I also want to include the voices of the men as well, you know, and I want to represent Vietnamese people as, as complex, as uh, conflicting sometimes, or very, very stubborn <laughs> as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we do evil things to each other. Um, and, and talking about, you know, representation of, of characters, I very much admire, you know, um, Viet Thanh Nguyen in the novel, The Sympathizer. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he, later he actually said, you know, um, as a minority writer, you, there's a tendency to write your, the characters from your, from your nationality as... Um, as Idealized. Yeah, yeah. As, as good characters, you know. Yeah. But it's important to place us on the equal position with 
with the ma my majority writer. So our characters can be good and evil as well. Of so course, I, course, yeah. yeah, so I enjoy writing about wicked ghosts, <laughs> about <laughs> people that he, he you have some wicked characters in there too, yeah. But I, I think I should write more of the wicked characters. <laughs> I, I, it's something you, you said in this, I, I'd like to um, reinforce also that if, if people haven't read this novel yet, you know, some of the people who are listening to this, um, I, I don't want it to seem like it's only about, about war and horror. What you said before about giving that picture of Vietnam, the beauty of it. I mean, this really comes, comes across so clearly in your writing, the, the beauty of the country, the beauty of the language, the beauty of the landscape, the, the, yeah, the terrible people, as you said, but also, but also the strength of, of, of people, uh, that whole, the whole complex mm -hmm. culture of it comes across. It comes across, your, your love for that, you know, really shines in the novel and in the beauty of the language, which is, you know, very impressive to me also, because you're writing in a, in a second language. It's, it's a crazy thing, because when I decided to write this novel, I, I quit my full-time job. <laughs> Know, I decided that, that this is my most important project of my life. I had wanted to do this, uh, to write a novel that could uh, tell a story of Vietnam as I, as I know it. So, mm -hmm. But I wanted to write in English, so I had to use the dictionary and I had to learn a lot. I still have to learn a lot of, of English these days. I have, I have a notebook with new words that I write on every day. And I, I read a lot by reading, I, I learn new words and I, I learn how to use the English language. But I also wanted to protect the vietnamese of my writing, you know, I, because I cannot write as a um, native language writer. And I don't want to write like, like, like you or, you know, mm -hmm. or like um, Ocean Vuong or Viet Thanh Nguyen. I cannot write like them because they're their English abilities is just, you know, out of my reach. But what I can do is write like a Vietnamese. So I want my characters to think like Vietnamese, to behave like Vietnamese, to speak like Vietnamese. So Vietnamese use a lot of proverbs in our daily life. So that's why I incorporate proverbs. And, um, and you know, the, the thing is that I did, I grew up inside Vietnam and I did not leave Vietnam for the first time when I was 20 years old. And, uh, you know, I, I, so Vietnam is, is a part of me. Vietnam is everything I have, you know. And writing is the act of returning home for me. I'm just, I'm really sick. So writing is an, the act of returning home, of, of, of visiting my homeland, of hearing the stories, of talking to people. So it is not just a part of a job, but it's a need, a mm. death. Need, you know you're not, you're not just reclaiming your grandmother you're reclaiming your whole country yes and i reclaim my identity you know mm -hmm. because i mean um, if i had a wish i would live inside vietnam because i feel like i belong there you know to eat the food to listen to the language you know it's, it's just so joyful i think any vietnamese i mean mm -hmm. any this this bot dear um, you know any overseas vietnamese in this group would agree with me you know there's no place like home you know there's no place like home so um yeah so i write to be home well i i wonder if if your exile makes that um even even sharper and even clearer the fact that you are in in, in exile makes it something that um you, you can approach with, with much more clarity and, and, uh, yeah. and need, obviously. But. Yeah, when you are far away from home, you have to write to be home. So I had to write so vividly so I could smell the food. <laughs> I could see the I can food. smell the food when I read your novel too. Then. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> because yeah. actually some readers actually made uh, non-Vietnamese readers, when they read the book, I, they decided to make Vietnamese food. Yeah. Makes me so happy. Yeah, so I have no choice but to make Vietnam alive in my book so I can be home. <laughs> so I hope you, when you read the book, you can be in Vietnam with me too. I, I have been, thank you. Um, there's a, a part in uh, chapter eight, 
um, Hung, who's living, she's living under the American bombing. Um, and she says, she wonders how many, quote, how many people around the world were having a normal day and didn't know how special and sacred it was. Mm. And, you know, my students were reading this novel and they applied that immediately to um, our present situation, to the, uh, to the, to the pandemic. Um, so I was, I was wondering, could, could you, in, in what other ways do you think the novel is something that uh, is good to read right now? You think of that whole that whole concept that she says uh, how how good it would be to have a normal day. Yeah, I think a normal day is what we all want to have right now, right? I yeah. mean, being in a pandemic now, it's like um, experiencing a war, and 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 that's why we appreciate much more, you know, the the sense of normality in our life that we had before. And I hope in reading this novel, readers also appreciate, you know, the ways the Chan family survived uh, different difficulties. And, and, you know, we all have strength inside of us and we all have kindness inside of us. Yeah. I think this pandemic let us show each other kindness and, and that will, and, you, and unity, we have to work together. And only through unity and kindness that we will, overcome this uh, this pandemic so i think uh now we have been talking long enough so so i see yeah. now. i see our moderator has appeared beneath yeah. us so. <laughs> we're ready for the q a um, reminder folks you can hit that raise hands icon to ask a question and we'll unmute people um so you can ask them aloud to play my while we're waiting for folks to raise their hands, uh, we do have a couple of written questions in the Q&A window. Uh, Sonia Adams asks, uh, who are your literary influences and what are some of your cultural influences? Well, oh, literary influences. Um, so one of my uh, first, um, the, one of the first books I read which I loved a lot, which I also wrote in, in the book is um, called um, um, Diary of the Cricket. So it's written by Tou Huai. It's a children's story, but it's, it's an, a story of imagination of this cricket leaving home and making troubles. And, and I imagine myself being a writer. I was inspired by that story. And um, I mean, now, nowadays, I'm inspired by so many people, Vietnamese writers, I'm inspired by Bao Ning, who wrote The Wonderful, The Sorrow of War, um, Dương Thu Hương for her bravery in, you know, uh, presenting Vietnamese stories in a, in a very courageous way. Um, you know, Viet Thanh Nguyen is um, my inspiration, the way that he's, he's, he's really, um, creative in his, his way of telling stories and Ocean Vuong is, is also amazing. Um, Wen Kalin is, um, has provided me with a lot of inspiration as well. I have learned a lot from Wen um, about his representation of, of trauma and PTSD in, in, in his work and it has helped me a lot. Tim O'Brien is also my literary hero. There are so many writers I can go on and on. There's so there, I'm, I mean, um, you know, uh, Vietnamese and, um, and non-Vietnamese writers. So I read um, both um, Vietnamese and English uh, literature. I read in both languages. For cultural influences, I don't know. I think the, the earliest influence was um, the Gazao song that my mother sang to me. She used... You know, we didn't have much food, so she made up for the lack of food by by songs. You know, she was singing these songs, so she wanted uh, her daughter to be well fed in the soul. So these um, Kazao songs, or um, or you know, um, they 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 fed me and they gave me the love for literature. And I think without those songs and my mother's love and my and you know, my father was um, my father was a teacher in literature, so he he also taught me a lot of things about the Vietnamese culture through his storytelling. Yeah, so I'm indebted to my parents. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, 
Thank you. Um, we have a similar question here from Teresa. She says, I learned about your book while attending a virtual author event with Julia Alvarez for Afterlife, who Greenlight actually has an event with next Tuesday on the 5th. Uh, we're excited about. She paused promoting her own book for several minutes to talk about how beautiful your book is and recommended that everyone read it. Um, and Teresa bought your book immediately. Would you like to pay it forward and recommend a book or two that you think the attendees here tonight should read? I must thank Julia. She's also my literary hero. I mean, I love her, her book, you know, Afterlife. I mean, Afterlife is a book that you should read right now because it's, 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 a, it's about, you know, um, the human ability to overcome um, challenges as well. It's a beautiful, beautiful novel told also in the voices of four women um, who, who encountered tremendous difficulties, but they 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 learn how to take care of themselves before they could take care of the others so so it's an amazing book to read and i highly recommend it um so um a current book which i'm really excited about is saigon saigon by phuc chan so it's a it's a memoir by a vietnamese who um who left vietnam um so after the war and his and and his memoir is such a, a fun read um, okay, so I'm I, I'm also reading uh, "Girl with uh, the Girl with the Louding Voice," and this novel is so original. So I mean, I'm I'm reading literature from uh, from different places, and I think you know, it's I remember um, a, a proverb, a saying from Bangladesh, you know, when I worked there, um, the man who does not read has no advantage of the man. Who's, um, who is illiterate. So, so I think, you know, being able to read and discover literature is like the greatest gift. So I, my, my, my to read book is like 20 of them. I'm reading so many at the same time. <laughs> Thank you for the question. See, we have someone raising their hand for a question. Barbara, I'm going to unmute you really quick. It's going to take just a couple seconds to go through. Mm -hmm. Hello. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I, I typed in my question. We just returned from a month of Vietnam and it was a spectacular trip. And we're just curious if you were to return, what part are you most comfortable in? Is there a particular place? <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I was born in a small village in the north of Vietnam called, um, um, so the village is called Khung Zhu. So, um, so I would love to return to that place. And I also love to return to a place that I grew up. It's called Bạc Liêu in the, it's in the southern tip of the Mekong Delta. And, uh, but the city of my heart is Hanoi. Hanoi is where I set my novel and where I, um, where I met my husband, fell in love and gave birth to my two kids there. And I have so many friends there and uh, I worked there for many years. So I love Hanoi, but I also want to return to Ho Chi Minh City or Saigon where my parents live. So I, you know, if I were to choose one place, I cannot choose. Normally when I go back to Vietnam, I, um, I travel all over the places and I love, love, love to return to my parents' villages, um, you know, in Ning Bing and, um, and in Nghệ An, because, you know, I fear that if I don't talk to older generation, they, they will pass away soon and take, you know, the, the stories away with them. So I, Every time that I go home, I want to go back to my parents' villages. And, you know, I, I don't want to do anything when I'm there. I just hang out and I cook and, and I cook and I talk with people. And, it, you know, they have all the time in the world for you. You know, they just want to talk to the, to the younger generation. Yeah, so I'm very greedy when it comes to Vietnam. I want all Vietnam. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoy Vietnam. Oh, it was spectacular. We were in the Mekong Delta too. Incredible. And Ninh Bien and all over. We went from top to bottom. Was, you have a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful country and beautiful people. Xin chào. Xin chào. <laughs> Xin chào. Xin chào. Cảm ơn rất nhiều. Thank you so much.
Let's see. Now we have a question from Jean. I'm going to unmute you. Take just a few seconds to go through. Jean, you should be able to talk now. Okay. I, it told me I could unmute myself. So I <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we've been in, in Vietnam three times um, since 2003. And the last two, we spent most of the time in the north, um, Tang in recently. And so most of our um, guys, we were with Habitat for Humanity. So most of the um, liaison people between um, Habitat and us were people, uh, you know, what be described as Gen X or millennials. And so my question for you is, um, what gives you hope? Uh, you, you mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, people have to come to grips with the, with the past and not just like forget about it and move on. And, and uh, so what gives you the most hope for this generation of, of young people, those in their 20s now? And what it, uh, it makes you feel a bit pessimistic about this generation um, and understanding the, the history that you've described? Oh, that's a complicated question. <laughs> but thank you for asking this very important question. When it comes to the younger generation who live in Vietnam, I, um, I think I have hope because they are very uh, progressive. Uh, you know, people are very ambitious. They work really hard. A lot of people can speak English well, as well as, you know, many other languages like like uh, a lot of them speak French or Japanese or Chinese and they are ambitious, you know, they want to build a good career and, um, and, and they are fast learners. And, but I think I'm a bit uh, disappointed that uh, we have a culture which is too um, materialistic nowadays, you know, too money minded people read less, you know, for example, I, I, um, I recently asked, um, um, a person who's 22 years old and I said what are you reading at the moment and he said oh I'm a business person I'm only reading business books so I told him you cannot be a good business person unless you understand about the society about history or human behavior you know you should read more widely but the younger generation now um, tend to read less and uh, uh, and you know um, so yeah, so there's there's still also there's also the the tendency to um, break apart from the the older generation. So um, so you know um, the younger generation are too busy now. They don't talk to to the older generation. So my book is a desperate um, act to hang on to the Vietnamese traditions, to the traditions of telling and listening to stories to the tradition of singing our Gaza songs, to our proverbs, to our poetry, to our language. And, and I fear a lot of things will be lost, you know, because Vietnam is, is becoming more modernized and people are chasing um, ma ma materialistic dreams. So, yeah, so, um, but I mean, there's still a part of, of the um, younger population who, who love to read and who love to connect. And I hope, you know, more people we read stories like the mountain sing and, and feel the need, you know, to connect with our history, with our culture more. Thank you so much. Let's see, and I think we have time for one more question from the audience. Um, I'm muting Bill McCloud. Take just a second here. Yeah. <laughs> Bill. So Bill is a great writer. He's, um, he's thank you very much. Bill, you should be able to talk now. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And uh, Kwe Mai, I just wanted to uh, point out uh, how it, I was amazed by the fact that you refer to butterflies on nine different occasions in your book uh, at appropriate times. I don't even know if you're aware of that. I'm also uh, impressed by the use of Treasure Island as a book in Hong's library, a bookshelf, because that's the first book I can remember reading. But the main thing I wanted to share with you was uh, I've never forgotten the idea that Hong had some of her poems published in a local newspaper, and she hoped that her father 
in the South would somehow be able to see them and that might lead him home. That is so tragic. Your writing is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, so actually, Treasure Island is also one of the books that I read, uh, one of the first foreign books I read as a child. And I remember, you know, wanting to discover the world, to travel the world, to embark on adventures. And it's, it's glorious, you know, that's the part of writing. And I'm thankful for for being able to write. And I'm taking adventures every day with my my writing. And <laughs> You know, I don't remember that I, I, I used butterflies nine times. <laughs> you counted them, you're amazing. But the thing is, I love nature. And as in the book I wrote, you know, when humans fail us, nature can save us. I think, you know, we couldn't have this pandemic uh, today if we were more aware more protective of our nature. We destroy too much of our nature. And um, yeah, so I love to write about butterflies and birds and, and trees and <laughs> everything around nature. And uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I hope that answer your question. Oh, and about that, you know, when I wrote um, about Hương's pu um, publishing her poems with the hope of finding her father, I just wanna highlight the power of literature. You know, because, um, yeah, literature can do wonderful things. I mean, the fact that I'm here speaking with all of you is beyond the widest dream. And imagine that I used to be a street seller, you know, growing up in the village of Vietnam. And, you know, and, you know, this little girl walking the street every day, sometimes barefoot, a lot of the times with an empty stomach, you know. And I had this dream of one day writing a book that could connect me to people around the world and to be able to tell my story. And, and I see that wonder today, you know, to be able to be with you today is, is just an amazing thing. So it's like, you know, like the poems of Hương, you know, finding its home. Yeah. And I find my home in you and your compassion for my novel and your compassion for Vietnam. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Quay Mai and Wayne, for coming out and talking to all of us tonight. And thank you to everyone who showed up. Um, a reminder, go ahead. Sorry, I just want to say that one of the books I highly recommend is um, Wayne's new novel. Um, a wolf of I'll tell you later. Thank you. A wolf by the ears. He just published this amazing novel, and instead of promoting his novel, he's he's doing an event with me and not uh, telling anyone about it. So Wayne, please tell the audience a little bit about your novel. Uh, thank you, Kwe Mai. I think you just did a, a great job, and, and and your check is in the mail for my publicity. <laughs> thank you. Wolf by the Ears is a, a, a story of the War of 1812 when uh, many uh, enslaved people went over to the British because they were promised their freedom. And it's um, an attempt to look at the tension between our ideals of freedom and democracy and the institution of slavery. Thank you for mentioning it, Clint.